Dreamscape presents Land of Hope by Wilfred M. McClay, narrated by Pete Cross. Every generation rewrites the past. In easy times, history is more or less an ornamental art, but in times of danger, we are driven to the written record by a pressing need to find answers to the riddles of today. We need to know what kind of firm ground other men belonging to generations before us have found to stand on. In spite of changing conditions of life, they were not very different from ourselves. Their thoughts were the grandfathers of our thoughts. They managed to meet situations as difficult as those we have to face, to meet them sometimes lightheartedly and in some measure to make their hopes prevail. We need to know how they did it. In times of change and danger, when there is a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present and get us past that idiot delusion of the exceptional now that blocks good thinking. That is why in times like ours, when old institutions are caving in and being replaced by new institutions, not necessarily in accord with most men's preconceived hopes, political thought has to look backwards as well as forwards. John Dos Passos, The Use of the Past, from The Ground We Stand On, some examples from the history of a political creed, 1941. Introduction, one long story. There are already dozens of highly competent, lavishly illustrated, and meticulously detailed accounts of the history of the United States in circulation. Why the need for this book, then? That is a very good question. The short answer is that this book seeks to accomplish something different from the others. You, the listener, will have to be the ultimate judge of whether it has been successful. But let me first take a few words to describe some of its guiding intentions. Its principal objective is very simple. It means to offer to American readers, young and old alike, an accurate, responsible, coherent, persuasive, and inspiring narrative account of their own country, an account that will inform and deepen their sense of the land they inhabit and equip them for the privileges and responsibilities of citizenship. Citizenship here encompasses something larger than the civics class meaning. It means a vivid and enduring sense of one's full membership in one of the greatest enterprises in human history, the astonishing, perilous, and immensely consequential story of one's own country. Let me emphasize the term story. Professional historical writing has for a great many years now been resistant to the idea of history as narrative. Some historians have even hoped that history could be made into a science, but this approach seems unlikely ever to succeed, if for no other reason than it fails to take into account the ways we need stories to speak to the fullness of our humanity and help us orient ourselves in the world. The impulse to write history and organize our world around stories is intrinsic to us as human beings. We are, at our core, remembering and story-making creatures, and stories are one of the chief ways we find meaning in the flow of events. What we call history and literature are merely the refinement and intensification of that basic human impulse, that need. The word need is not an exaggeration. For the human animal, meaning is not a luxury, it is a necessity. Without it, we perish. Historical consciousness is to civilized society what memory is to individual identity. Without memory and without the stories by which our memories are carried forward, we cannot say who or what we are. Without them, our life and thought dissolve into a meaningless, unrelated rush of events. Without them, we cannot do the most human of things. We cannot learn, use language, pass on knowledge, raise children, establish rules of conduct, engage in science, or dwell harmoniously in society. Without them, we cannot govern ourselves. Nor can we have a sense of the future as a time we know will come, because we remember that other tomorrows also have come and gone. A culture without memory will necessarily be barbarous and easily tyrannized, even if it is technologically advanced. 
The incessant waves of daily events will occupy all our attention and defeat all our efforts to connect past, present, and future, thereby diverting us from an understanding of the human things that unfold in time, including the paths of our own lives. The stakes were beautifully expressed in the words of the great Jewish writer Isaac Beshevis Singer. When a day passes, it is no longer there. What remains of it? Nothing more than a story. If stories weren't told or books weren't written, man would live like the beasts, only for the day. The whole world, all human life, is one long story. Singer was right. As individuals, as communities, as countries, we are nothing more than flotsam and jetsam without the stories in which we find our lives meaning. These are stories of which we are already a part, whether we know it or not. They are the basis of our common life, the webs of meaning in which our shared identities are suspended. This book is an invitation to become acquainted with one of those webs of meaning, the American story. It does not pretend to be a complete and definitive telling of that story. Such an undertaking would be impossible in any event because the story is ongoing and far from being concluded. But it is also the case that this book has striven to be as compact as possible. As any author will tell you, the most painful task in writing a book of this kind is deciding what to leave out. It is always very easy to add things, but very difficult to take them out, because every detail seems important. One is constantly committing cruel acts of triage, large and small, throwing details out of the lifeboat to keep the vessel from sinking, a harsh but necessary act if what remains is to take on the shape of a story rather than a mere accumulation of facts. As will be clear, I have chosen to emphasize the political history of the United States at every turn, treating it as the skeleton of the story, its indispensable underlying structure. This emphasis is particularly appropriate for the education of American citizens living under a Republican form of government. There are other ways of telling the story, and my own choice of emphasis should not be taken to imply that the other aspects of our history are not worth studying. On the contrary, they contain immense riches that historians have only begun to explore. But one cannot do everything all at once. One must begin at the beginning with the most fundamental structures before one can proceed to other topics. The skeleton is not the whole of the body, but there cannot be a functional body without it. History is the study of change through time, and theoretically, it could be about almost anything that happens but it must be selective if it is to be intelligible. Indeed, in practice, what we call history leaves out many of the important aspects of life. It generally does not deal with the vast stretches of time during which life goes on normally, during which people fall in love, have families, raise their children, bury their dead, and carry on with the small acts of heroism, sacrifice, and devotion that mark so much of everyday life. The unhistoric acts, as George Eliot wrote in the closing words of Middlemarch, of those who lived faithfully in a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. There are a few moments like the American holiday of Thanksgiving or great public commemorations at which the low murmur of those ordinary things becomes audible and finds a measure of public acknowledgement. But by and large, history is interested in the eruptions of the extraordinary into the flow of the regular it must leave out so very much. This book extends a come-as-you-are invitation, and as such, it attempts to be a friendly point of entry for all sorts of listeners and students of history, whatever their background. As the best stories show us, simplicity and complexity are not mutually exclusive. Hence, this book strives to be, as the ancient sage put it, a river shallow enough for the lamb to go wading, but deep enough for the elephant to swim. I hope all those who are new to the subject will be so intrigued that they will want to venture into deeper waters and eventually turn to the many outstanding books and authors that can take them much, much further and deeper than this book possibly can. But I hope that I have also done some justice to the deeper waters without sacrificing the book's accessibility. For both sorts of readers, I try to keep before us the recognition that history is not just an inert account of indisputable and self-explanatory details. It is a reflective task that calls to the depths of our humanity. It means asking questions and asking them again and again 
and asking fresh questions as the experience of life causes fresh questions to arise. The past does not speak for itself, and it cannot speak to us directly. We must first ask. It may have things to tell us that we have not yet thought to ask about, but it can be induced to address some of our questions if we learn to ask them rightly. That is one of the many subtle glories of the study of history. Finally, I'd like to offer a word about the book's title, which forms one of the guiding and recurrent themes of the book. As the book argues from the very outset, the Western Hemisphere was inhabited by people who had come from elsewhere, unwilling to settle for the conditions into which they were born and drawn by the prospect of a new beginning, the lure of freedom, and the space to pursue their ambitions in ways their respective old worlds did not permit. Hope has both theological and secular meanings, spiritual ones as well as material ones. Both these sets of meanings exist in abundance in America. In fact, nothing about America better defines its distinctive character than the ubiquity of hope, a sense that the way things are initially given to us cannot be the final word about them, that we can never settle for that. Even those who are bitterly critical of America and find its hopes to be delusions cannot deny the enduring energy of those hopes and are not immune to their pull. Of course, hope and opportunity are not synonymous with success. Being a land of hope will also sometimes mean being a land of dashed hopes, of disappointment. That is unavoidable. A nation that professes high ideals makes itself vulnerable to searing criticism when it falls short of them, sometimes far short, indeed, as America often has. We should not be surprised by that, however. Nor should we be surprised to discover that many of our heroes turn out to be deeply flawed human beings. All human beings are flawed, as are all human enterprises. To believe otherwise is to be naive, and much of what passes for cynicism in our time is little more than naivete in deep disguise. What we should remember, though, is that the history of the United States, and of the West more generally, includes the activity of searching self-criticism as part of its foundational makeup. There is immense hope implicit in that process if we go about it in the right way. That means approaching the work of criticism with constructive intentions and a certain generosity that flows from the mature awareness that none of us is perfect, and that we should therefore judge others as we would ourselves wish to be judged, blending justice and mercy. One of the worst sins of the present, not just ours, but any present, is its tendency to condescend toward the past, which is much easier to do when one doesn't trouble to know the full context of that past, or try to grasp the nature of its challenges as they presented themselves at the time. This small book is an effort to counteract that condescension and remind us of how remarkable were the achievements of those who came before us, how much we are indebted to them. Chapter 1, Beginnings, Settlement and Unsettlement. History always begins in the middle of things. It doesn't matter where you choose to start the story. There is always something essential that came before, some prior context that is assumed. This is why the past can't be divided up into convenient self-contained units with clear and distinct beginnings and endings, much as we might wish it were otherwise. Instead, the spectacle that lies before us when we gaze backward is more like a sprawling, limitless river with countless mingling branches and tributaries stretching back to the horizon. Like a river, time's restless force pushes ever forward, but its beginnings lie far back, extending far beyond what we can see, fading into the mists of time at the edges of lands beyond our knowing. Consider the story of your own life. The story didn't begin with you. You didn't call yourself into existence out of the void. You didn't invent the language you speak or the foods you eat or the songs you sing. You didn't build the home you grew up in, or pave the streets you walked, or devise the subjects you learned in school. Others were responsible for these things. Others, especially your parents, taught you to walk, to talk, to read, to dress, to behave properly, and everything else that goes with everyday life in a civilized society, things that you mainly take for granted. But it's important to remember that those others didn't come into the world knowing these things either. 
your parents didn't invent themselves any more than you did. And the people who taught them were just the same in that regard, taught by people before them, who were taught by people before them, and so on in an ever-lengthening chain of human transmission that soon carries us back into the misty unknown. We carry the past forward into the present much more than we realize, and it forms a large part of who we are. Even at the moment of birth, we already find ourselves in the middle of things. So how far back would you go in telling your own story? You could go back pretty far if you wanted to. Many people are fascinated by tracing out their family histories, their genealogies. The details can be surprising and intriguing, and they may reveal unsuspected things about your ancestors, but too much of that will get in the way of relating the most important parts of the story and illuminating the pattern of your own life. Too much detail muddies the picture and defeats the ultimate purpose. What we call history is the same way. It is not the sum of the whole past. It doesn't include everything, and it couldn't. Instead, it is a selection out of that expansive river of the past, like a carefully cropped photograph, organized wisely and truthfully, which allows us to focus in with clarity on a particular story with particular objectives in mind. The story that this book seeks to tell, the story of the United States, is exactly like this. It is not going to be the story of everything. It's a story about who we are and about the stream of time we share. It is an attempt to give us a clearer understanding of the middle of things in which we already find ourselves. And it is crafted with a particular purpose in mind, to help us learn, above all else, the things we must know to become informed, self-aware, and dedicated citizens of the United States of America, capable of understanding and appreciating the nation in the midst of which we find ourselves of carrying out our duties as citizens, including protecting and defending what is best in its institutions and ideals. The goal, in short, is to help us be full members of the society of which we are already a part. So where to begin? After all, there is a long, complex, and fascinating prologue to this story. We could go back many thousands of years to the very edges of the mist, and examine what we know or think we know about the ancient origins of this country. And as in a family genealogy, we would find some surprises. For one thing, it turns out that there are no peoples that could truly be called native to America, because all appear to have migrated there from other parts of the world. In other words, the entire Western Hemisphere, including both North and South America, was from the start populated by immigrants by peoples who came there from someplace else in search of something new and better. Our best guess at present is that the first human settlers came over into the Western Hemisphere 20,000 to 30,000 years ago from Northeastern Asia, probably by crossing over an icy land bridge or by island hopping across what is now the Bering Strait, the frigid waters that separate Russia and Alaska. From there, we believe that these first immigrants to America gradually filtered outward and downward thinly populating all of North and South America, from the frozen Yukon to the southernmost tip of Patagonia, and east to the Atlantic Ocean and the forests and rivers and swamps of the American Midwest and South. Some of those migrant peoples would long remain confined to the life of Stone Age nomads, for whom the elemental power of fire, along with crude implements made of stone or bone, were their chief shields against the pitiless ferocity of nature. Others, however, moved into more settled forms of habitation, adopting the practice of agriculture, and in some cases, eventually developing into highly advanced cultures. These cultures rose, flourished, and fell, blazing a trail across time, but leaving behind for us little literature or history, only a few poignant material reminders of them. Most impressive of these to us today were the classic cultures of Middle and South America, the Mayas and Aztecs of Mexico, and the Incas of Peru which erected formidable civilizations featuring splendid cities filled with elaborate pyramids, temples, and courts, some of which survive to the present day. Far less grand but just as intriguing are the remains of the North American settlements, such as those of the Adena and Hopewell cultures, that left large earthworks and burial mounds scattered across the landscape of the American East and Midwest, still readily visible today in ordinary places like Chillicothe, Ohio, or Romney, West Virginia, 
These two are eerily silent clues to a once flourishing but now vanished way of life. Much the same can be said of the ancestral Pueblo peoples of the arid Four Corners region of the American Southwest, sometimes called by the Navajo name Anasazi, a peaceful and highly organized people who left behind their startlingly modern-looking multi-story cliff dwellings tucked in beneath overhanging cliffs, structures whose remnants can still be seen today in places like Mesa Verde, Colorado, and the Chaco Canyon area of northwestern New Mexico. There is something haunting and melancholy about the remaining traces of these earliest civilizations. Hints of their once grand presence still linger in the American landscape, like faded echoes of a distant drama. Their mysteries intrigue us, but they are in only the most remote sense a part of American history. They do not play an important role in this book, simply because they have no direct or significant role in the establishment of the settlements and institutions that would eventually make up the country we know as the United States. Neither did the later discovery and exploration in the early 11th century of a new world by adventurous Norse seamen like Leif Erikson of Iceland, an enterprising fellow who sought to plant a colony on what is now the large Canadian island of Newfoundland. He and other Norsemen tried their best to establish a settlement in this newfound land to the west, to which he gave the cheerful name of Vinland. But their efforts came to nothing, and are generally counted as historical curiosities. Interesting false starts on American history, perhaps, but no more than that. But not so fast. Maybe this statement needs to be modified. Maybe the lost civilizations of the first Americans and the episodic voyages of Erikson and other Norsemen taken together do point powerfully, if indirectly, toward the recognizable beginnings of American history. For they point to the presence of America in the world's imagination as an idea, as a land of hope, of refuge and opportunity, of a second chance at life for those willing to take it. Perhaps that seems a fanciful statement. After all, we can never be sure exactly what forces and impulses led those earliest Asiatic peoples 20,000 years ago to cross over into Alaska and make the dangerous and costly journey to populate a new continent. What was in their minds? Were they mainly pushed by dire necessity, such as war or scarcity? Were they hunters who were merely following their quarry? Or were they in part pulled into the new lands by a sense of promise or opportunity or even adventure that those lands offered? We don't know. The answers to those questions will probably always remain beyond our reach. But we know that the Norsemen's brave impulse of over a thousand years ago, which drove them to go forth in search of new lands, came out of something more than mere necessity. They were drawn to cross the icy and turbulent waters of the North Atlantic by the lure of available Western lands and by a restless desire to explore and settle those lands. And they were influenced by sentiments that were already widespread in their time, a thousand years after Christ and 500 years before Columbus. From the beginning, there was a mystique about the West. Leif's explorer father, Eric the Red, played upon that very mystique when he gave the alluring name of Greenland to the largely frozen island mass we know by that name today. He was appealing to an idea already long embedded in literature, myth, and religion that there were new lands of plenty and wonder and mystery out there, perhaps even an earthly paradise, waiting to be found lying somewhere in lands beyond the western horizon. This message was especially alluring at the dawn of the new millennium, at a time when post-Roman Europe was stagnating disorganized and underdeveloped, still struggling to get back on its feet. But the message itself was not new. The ancient Greeks had spoken this way a millennium and a half earlier. They sang of the Isles of the Blessed, where the heroes and gods of their mythology dwelled in a fertile land where there was no winter, and of the Elysian fields, which the poet Homer located on the western edge of the earth, beside the stream of the world's seas. Centuries later, at the outset of a new age of exploration, Sir Thomas More's book, Utopia, 1516, described an ideal society located on an island in the West, as did Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis, 1627, the very title of his book recalling one of the most enduring legends of the West, the strange story of the Isle of Atlantis, a fully developed civilization with kings of great and mighty power that had been swallowed up by the seas and disappeared forever from view.
So the West had long been thought of in Europe as a direction offering renewal and discovery, a place of wealth and plenty, a land of hope, a vivid anticipation of what a new world could be like. And as we shall soon see, the shape taken on by this expectation would owe more to the yearnings of the old world than to the realities of the new. So, since we must begin in the middle of things, we will start our history of America in the middle of Europe's history. In fact, the two histories cannot be understood apart from one another. America is best understood as an offshoot of Europe. Even the name, America, comes from the first name of the Italian-born navigator and explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, who was among the first to speculate that the lands Columbus discovered were not the easternmost parts of Asia, but part of an entirely new landmass. But America would prove to be an unusual kind of offshoot. It was not like a new branch emerging out of the trunk of a great tree, duplicating the appearance and structure of the trunk and the tree's other branches, nor was it a careful and deliberate transplant, a smaller spin-off of what had already been established in Europe. Instead, it would receive certain parts of Europe, certain fragments that had been broken off from the whole, particularly English laws and customs, and would give those fragments a new home in a new land where they could develop and flourish in ways that would never have been possible in their native habitat. But so much of it was unpredictable, unplanned, unanticipated. The writer Lewis Mumford expressed this surprising process in a single brilliant sentence. The settlement of America had its origins in the unsettlement of Europe. What did Mumford mean by this? He meant that by the time of Christopher Columbus's famous voyage in 1492, which was one of the signal events in the making of America, Europe was becoming a dramatically different place from what it had been for the three preceding centuries, during the relatively stable and orderly years we now call the High Middle Ages, 1000 to 1300. By the late Middle Ages, 1300 to 1500, Europe was entering the modern age, in the process becoming a place of pervasive change and innovation of all kinds, a great upsurge in fresh energies and disruptions converging from many different directions at once was unsettling a great deal of what had become familiar in the older world. If any one of these innovations or disruptions had come along by itself without the company of others, say if the desire for expansion of global commerce had not been accompanied by breakthrough inventions that provided the technological means to make such commerce possible, its effects would have been far less pronounced. But by coming together at once, these innovations gathered strength from one another so that they contributed to a more general transforming fire, as when many small blazes fuel a greater conflagration. Such is the case with all historical transformations. They arise not out of a single cause, but out of the confluence of causes. This unsettling transformation of Europe that was already well underway in 1492 was throwing off flames that would land in other places and set off transformations there as well. The exploration and settlement of America would be one of the most consequential of these flames, the product of a host of great European disruptions, economic, social, religious, technological, and cultural. What makes the story even more surprising is the fact that the movement toward the West actually began with a movement toward the East. Some key changes for Europe were wrought unintentionally by the Crusades, which were a church-sanctioned military effort in the 11th to 13th centuries to free the Holy Lands from their Muslim occupiers, who had, in the four centuries since the death of Muhammad in 632, conquered two-thirds of the Christian world. Far from being intended as an early act in the unsettlement of medieval Europe, or as an act of unprovoked aggression, the Crusades were meant to be part of Europe's ongoing work of self-restoration. They were in many ways a perfect expression of the high medieval spirit in Western Europe, a world that was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church as a spiritual, political, and military power. But we are more concerned here with one of the indirect effects of the Crusades, which was to bring Europeans into contact with the riches of the lands along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea, consequently opening up overland trade routes to Asia, from which many desirable goods such as rugs, silks, gold brocade, perfumes, teas, precious stones, dye woods, and unusual spices such as pepper, nutmeg, and cloves could be imported. 
Small wonder that the East came to hold such a cultural fascination for many Europeans. A widely read memoir by the Venetian traveler Marco Polo, featuring spellbinding stories of his adventures along the Silk Road and in the lavish court of the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan, gave Europeans their first direct knowledge of the fabled wealth of China and Central Asia and sparked the restless imaginations of future explorers like Columbus and Ferdinand Magellan. The benefits of commerce with Asian cultures were obvious and enticing. There were many obstacles, however. Overland trade with the East along the legendary Silk Road was slow, costly, and dangerous, and became more so after the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. It could take a year to go from Venice to Beijing by land, traversing mountains and deserts on narrow trails with cargo packed on the backs of horses and camels. Muslim Turks and other unfriendly groups controlled the land routes to the east, so that even if travelers were able to elude bandits, there would be levies to be paid to local potentates and middlemen along the way, making the goods very expensive by the time they finally arrived at markets in Europe. As consumer demand for these luxuries grew and interest in trade with the east swelled, it became more and more urgent to find a better way of getting there and back. The search was on to discover an all-water route to the east, which if found, would go a long way towards solving these problems. This search helped more generally to boost the era's attention to ocean-going exploration and stimulate a thoroughly modern passion for extending and mapping the contours of the known world. Fortunately, vital technological inventions and improvements in navigation and ship design became available that made such expansive voyages possible. Advances in map making and astronomical navigation, the dry magnetic compass, the astrolabe, the quadrant, the cross step, and other such instruments, as well as the development of new ships, such as the ocean going Genoese Carrick and the fast and maneuverable Portuguese Caravel, whose ingenious combination of differently shaped sails enabled them to move easily against the wind. Innovation did not stop there, though. The rapid expansion of trade was remaking the social and political map of Europe, at the same time that explorers were redrawing the physical map. In earlier eras, wealth and power had rested in the hands of those who owned land. But that was about to change. The years of expanding seaborne travel saw the rising economic and political power of a merchant class, made up of those traders who had become wealthy from the risks and rewards of expanding commerce. Those years also saw the steadily growing importance of bustling market towns and port cities, where the merchants' commercial activities would come to be concentrated, and where a host of ancillary middle-class businesses and professions, bankers, lawyers, insurance providers, outfitters, and suppliers of goods and services, teachers, would set up shop and thrive. These changes would have far-reaching effects, further unsettling the existing order. The spectacular rise of the new merchant elites in places like Lisbon, Seville, and Venice challenged the power of old, local, and regional aristocracies, whose power had been based on their possession of land in a relatively closed and stationary feudal economy. Such older elites either had to accommodate themselves to the newcomers or be swept aside. The older ways were no match for the dynamic, wealth-generating, and disruptive new economics of trade. Such changes would give rise, in turn, to new and unprecedented political structures. In Italy, ambitious merchant princes used their new wealth to create powerful city-states, such as Florence and Venice, which featured glamorous palaces, churches, and other architectural and artistic wonders, echoing the glories of Greek and Roman antiquity. In other places, the changes would lead to the emergence of great national monarchies, unified and centralized kingdoms over which individual rulers would be able to govern with vast authority and power. Such monarchs managed to break the hold of the local nobles and regional aristocrats who had dominated the feudal system and to create larger and more cohesive nations featuring a new kind of national scale order with a uniform national currency, a removal of internal barriers to trade, a professional standing military that kept internal order and supported the nation's interests abroad, all innovations that would further the interests of the merchant and middle classes, even as they helped to build the nation. By 1492, four such national states were emerging in Europe, France, England, Spain, and Portugal. All four 
had both the wealth and the motivation to support the further exploration that would be needed to find a water route to the east and to expand the reach of their commerce and their growing power. It was Portugal, though, that took the initiative in this age of discovery, early in the 15th century, under the guidance and patronage of Infante Enrique, later to be known as Prince Henry the Navigator, 1394 to 1460. Portugal was a small country, but as the westernmost country of mainland Europe, with an extensive Atlantic coastline and the magnificent ports of Lisbon and Porto, it was perfectly situated to become an ocean-going power, and eventually the first global empire in the history of the world. Under Henry's leadership, Portugal became a magnet for the most able and advanced navigators and seamen from all over Europe, who were drawn to take part in the expeditions he sponsored. Step by step, skilled Portuguese crews charted the entire west coast of Africa, opening it up to commerce and eventually, explorers like Bartolomeo Diaz and Vasco da Gama would round the southern end of the African continent and by 1498 establish the long sought waterborne path to India. The example of such Portuguese exploits drew Christopher Columbus away from his native Italian city state of Genoa to settle in Lisbon at the age of 26. He was already a highly experienced and capable sailor who had been to ports in the Mediterranean and Northern Europe, and in partnership with his brother, voyaged under the Portuguese flag as far north as the Arctic Ocean, south along the coasts of West Africa, and west to the Azor Islands. Like everyone else of the time, he was obsessed with the idea of discovering an all-water route to the Indies, as the Far East was called but he had his own ideas about the best way of doing it. Everyone else was confident that going east and rounding Africa was the key. Bartolomeo Diaz seemed to have confirmed that when he rounded Africa in 1488. But Columbus became convinced that going west would be both faster and more direct, and he formulated a plan for an expedition that would prove it. When he took the plan to the King of Portugal in search of financial support, however, he was turned down twice. Then he appealed to leaders in Genoa and Venice, and in England, and then in Spain, and had no luck with any of them. All of them said the plan was impractical and grossly underestimated the distances involved. Finally, however, after determined negotiations, Columbus was able to persuade the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, to support him, and they signed an agreement called the Capitulations of Santa Fe. On August 3, 1492, he set sail from Palos de la Frontera in Spain aboard a large carrack called the Santa Maria, accompanied by two caravels and carrying a Latin passport and a sheath of letters of introduction, including a letter of introduction from Ferdinand and Isabella to the Emperor of China, just in case. He also brought along a Jewish scholar who was conversant in Arabic so that he would be able to communicate with any Muslims he encountered at his oriental destinations. What may have been lacking in hard evidence for Columbus's theories, he more than made up for by the fervency of his faith. He fully expected that he would end up in the Far East. Not only was Columbus fiercely determined, but he was a superb and knowledgeable sailor, with all the latest navigational tools in his arsenal. But a spirit of almost unimaginable daring was required to face the perils of a transatlantic voyage in his time since it meant placing oneself at the mercy of harsh elements that could crush and drown one's fragile enterprise at any moment. Nor could Columbus really know exactly where he was going. Despite all his calculations, most of which were wildly inaccurate, his voyage would be a giant leap into the unknown. The shape of the larger world was still a murky mystery, as can be seen in the crude maps at Columbus's disposal, such as the 1491 Enriquez Martellus map that he very likely studied in advance of his voyage. After a month at sea without sight of land, his crew began to feel overwhelmed by the dread of a watery death, and they threatened to mutiny. Yet Columbus stood adamant, and his commanding determination prevailed over their worries. The three ships sailed on. On October 12th, his party spotted land, one of the islands of the Bahamas, which Columbus named San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior. What they had found was, in fact, an outpost of a new and unexplored landmass. But Columbus refused to believe that these lands could be anything other than the Indies he had counted upon finding. And he accordingly called the gentle Taino natives who greeted them by the name Indians. 
be sure, he found none of the plentiful spices, jewels, gold, silver, and other precious goods that Marco Polo's account had led him to expect. The Caribbean islands were beguilingly beautiful, but they were full of exotic plants and trees that did not correspond to anything he knew or had read about. He was able to admit that he did not recognize them, but he was not able to imagine that he was looking at an altogether new world. Between 1492 and 1503, Columbus commanded four round-trip voyages between Spain and the Americas, all of them under the sponsorship of the Spanish crown. He was not the first European to reach the Americas, but he was the first to establish enduring contact between the old world and the new. Hence his voyages are of great significance in the history of Europe and mark a proper beginning for our story as the first elements of Europe's unsettlement that would reach western shores and begin to give rise to the settlement of America. But Columbus was not able to see it that way. He insisted, in the face of all evidence to the contrary, that the lands he visited during those voyages were part of Asia. He was possessed by an iron resoluteness that his initial theory had to be true. By his third voyage, which took him to present-day Venezuela, he came to believe that while that land was not the Indies proper, it was merely a barrier between him and them, and that all that remained was to find a strait or other passage through. His final voyage was an unsuccessful effort to find that strait, a journey that took him even to what would later be the site of the Panama Canal, just a few miles away from the immensity of a Pacific Ocean that he never knew was there. But he returned home in disgrace and was regarded as a failure. What a strange irony it is he had made one of the most important discoveries in human history, and yet he didn't realize it. He was never able to understand the meaning of what he had discovered. His preoccupation with finding a new way to reach the riches of the East was the force that had propelled him into a far more momentous discovery in the West, the mysterious land of mythic renewal. And yet he could not see what was before him with fresh and open eyes. He was blind to its possibilities. In 1951, almost 500 years later, the American poet Robert Frost would capture this irony in a witty poem about Columbus called, And All We Call American. Had but Columbus known enough, he might have boldly made the bluff that better than da Gama's gold, he had been given to behold the race's future trial place, a fresh start for the human race. America is hard to see, Less partial witnesses than he in book on book have testified, they could not see it from outside, or inside either, for that matter. America is hard to see. Columbus had trouble seeing America for the new thing that it was, and could be, and eventually would become. He was not the first, and he would not be the last. It is part of the human condition, and a recurrent feature of human history, that what we find is not always what we were looking for and what we accomplish is not always what we set out to do. Hence, too, the reality that Columbus's journeys were also the beginning of a great collision of cultures, a process that nearly always entails tragic and bitter consequences. Hence, the cruel irony, as we shall see, that the settlement of America by newcomers would also produce a profound unsettlement for those who were not newcomers. The fresh start for the world came at a heavy price for those who were already settled on the land, men and women for whom San Salvador was not a new world being discovered, but an old and familiar world about to be transformed.